Good morning. We're here to discuss the case of Kohler v. Bank of Bermuda and the implications that, that case has for judgment creditors throughout the country. The main point of that case is how to obtain foreign assets if you are a domestic creditor when those assets are located outside of the jurisdiction. This case is, has raised significant implications for many creditors because it pushes the boundaries of what assets can be garnished using state law. This presents uh, wide-ranging opportunities to obtain foreign assets which is ever more common in a globalized environment. We're going to start off by discussing the facts of Kohler and what the court held there as what the rules that come out of that case are. We'll then move on to discuss several issues that have arisen in the wake of Kohler, with particular emphasis on what the Kohler case means as district courts continue to interpret that high court's opinion. We'll then move on to, the North, to New York's uh, procedure, and it is the procedure of uh, the New York legislature that was actually at issue in that case and we will examine what, that stat what the statutes actually said. We'll then take a big shift towards uh, non-New York law by looking at the Uniform Enforcement of Foreign Judgment Acts, as well as North Carolina procedure. When we examine North Carolina procedure, we are going to do so from the perspective of how the Kohler facts, if applied to a situation similar to something in North Carolina, what the end result would actually be. Uh, I think, as you will see, the end result of this all is that the Kohler opinion is really breaking down borders as a means of frustrating uh, creditor action. The facts of the Kohler opinion are not very difficult. In June of 1993, Mr. Kohler obtained a judgment against Mr. Dodwell. Kohler was at the time a citizen of Pennsylvania, while Dodwell a citizen of Bermuda. The judgment was obtained in the Federal District Court for the District of Maryland. Shortly thereafter of obtaining that judgment, it was registered in the Southern District of New York the Federal District Court in Manhattan. At the same time, Mr. Dodwell owned various stock in a Bermuda corporation. The legal situs of this stock was in Bermuda. It was being held by the Bank of Bermuda Limited as collateral against the obligation that Mr. Dodwell had with respect to that bank. At the same time, Bank of Bermuda Limited, the bank located in Bermuda, operated a subsidiary in, the, in Manhattan within the jurisdiction of the Southern District of New York. Mr. Kohler, in an effort to satisfy his judgment, then brought a garnishment action using Article 52 of New York's procedure, which covers the enforcement of money judgments. This was then served upon an officer of the Bank of Bermuda Limited, the New York branch, and shortly thereafter, the court ordered a turnover <coughs> proceeding. It is this turnover proceeding that is the subject of the litigation in the Kohler opinion. To give you some perspective of what was at issue here, Litigation took more than 16 years to complete, beginning with the obtainment of the judgment on the merits in 1993 and continuing on to the court's opinion in 2009. Again, as I just said, what's at issue here is a turnover order, which comes from October of 1993. Uh, it is that turnover, or turnover order that was subject to 10 years of litigation. It is important to understand what the plaintiff, or I'm sorry, what the defendant, the garnishee, the Bank of Bermuda was actually saying. They argued, in essence, that there was no personal jurisdiction to hail them before the court, and therefore no jurisdiction to compel them to turn over assets, that is, the stock, to Mr. Kohler. After 10 years of litigation, however, suddenly Bank of Bermuda decided to consent to personal jurisdiction. That was in 2003. Shortly thereafter, in 2004, Bank of Bermuda then informed Mr. Kohler and the Southern District that it no longer was in possession of the stock. The obligation for which the stock had been pledged as collateral was satisfied, and as a result, the bank then released the shares to Mr. Uh, Dabo. In the course of things, the district court dismissed the action, it interpreted New York law, New York state law, to prohibit the attachment of property that was not within the state. Put differently, it said that a New York court needed to have in rem jurisdiction over the assets. It would not be sufficient to have in personam jurisdiction over the party. This question was then appealed to the Second Circuit which reviewed New York law and determined that there was not sufficient law on the record for the federal court to make an informed decision. It therefore certified this question to the, new, the highest court in the state of New York, which is the New York Court of Appeals. This was then the issue before that court. Again, it is very important to understand what Bank of Bermuda's position was. Dodwell was a citizen of Bermuda who was not located at that time within New York. The stock was in the shares of a Bermuda-based corporation. The legal situs of the shares was Bermuda. It was being held by Bank of Bermuda in Bermuda. Uh, yeah. uh, the Bank of Bermuda was arguing that nothing short of in rem jurisdiction over the assets in this situation would be sufficient to compel them to turn over the assets into the jurisdiction. Uh, 
The court, however, disagreed. The court focuses on several factors. Most important was its distinguishment between pre-judgment attachment and post-judgment garnishment. That is the stage at which the court can compel the turnover of assets. In pre-judgment attachment, New York looks to Article 62, which will be discussed in a, in a little while. Here, it's important to realize that you have not lost on the merits of the case. The whole point of a pre-judgment attachment is to prevent the debtor or potential debtor from destroying the property, or more likely, from removing the property from the jurisdiction so as to frustrate the creditor's remedies. Uh, this action is done in rem. In order to actually attach the property pre-judgment, the court must have jurisdiction over the assets themselves. Uh, and this is accomplished by means of a motion. Because the, the party has not actually lost on the merits, it is felt that nothing short of in rem jurisdiction will suffice. By contrast, Article 52 governs post-judgment attachment, which in this case is a garnishment action, and that is what's at issue in the Kohler opinion. Here, unlike a pre-judgment attachment, you have lost on the merits. That is to say, the judgment debtor has, by a court order, owes judgment creditor money. Uh, this is done by special proceeding, unlike an Article 62 pre-judgment attachment. A special proceeding uh, is something substantially more than a motion. And the reason for this is to allow the garnishee to assert any interest it has in the property. Or alternatively, a fourth party can assert any interest in the property. This is done to protect their interest. This is why it's not done by means of a simple motion. With this distinction in mind, the court looks to the statutory language of Article 52 and notes that there are no territorial limits on the court's jurisdiction. Moreover, recent amendments by the New York legislature to the relevant statutes have made clear that they have made an effort to assist domestic, that is, New York creditors, in finding out-of-state, that is, foreign uh, assets to satisfy their judgments. Because of this, the court is of the opinion that it does not need to have jurisdiction over the assets themselves, but rather only, at, only personal jurisdiction over the, uh, the garnishee in this action, which is, Col which is the Bank of Bermuda. Several things come out of this opinion, uh, which is important to realize. Once again, it is sufficient in this case, according to the highest court in New York, to have personal jurisdictions over the garnishee. Now, there is, of course, some question as to whether the garnishee, uh, whether there are separate garnishees for the New York um, branch or the Bank of Bermuda located in Bermuda. Nevertheless, the court rules that it is sufficient to have personal jurisdiction over Bank of Bermuda in this action. Uh, one of the lingering issues that comes out of this is, um, or one of the key factors that comes out of it, though, is what I just talked about is that it's critical to distinguish pre-judgment from post-judgment. What happened in Kohler could never, ever happen in a pre-judgment action because what is required there is nothing short of in rem, jurisdiction over the assets themselves. Uh, Article Section 5225B, which will be discussed shortly in more detail, provides for a special proceeding. The court, at least in dicta, indicated that this special proceeding provides an independent basis of jurisdiction over the garnishee therefore providing the necessary personal jurisdiction to hail the garnishee before the court and therefore to compel the turnover of assets. Kohler, however, was a very high level approach to answering these questions. As the case was certified by the Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals to New York, it was solely a question of law and did not really focus on factual matters. It also did not resolve several issues which are very likely to come up. For example, what facts are necessary to establish personal jurisdiction? As we discussed before, uh, Bank of Bermuda consented to personal jurisdiction in this case. Therefore, the court did not, was not required to conduct an inquiry into what would be necessary to establish personal jurisdiction. This is likely to be an important issue going forward as district courts and lower courts have to look at what facts and what contacts are necessary to establish personal jurisdiction over a foreign garnishee so as to allow the turnover of assets into New York jurisdiction. A second thing is what happens if the farm branches have not conceded personal jurisdiction, as was the case here. This is closely related to the first case, but I think it's quite clear that no matter how the court gets its jurisdiction, once it does, it can compel the turnover of assets in line with the Kohler opinion. This potentially has lessons for foreign parties uh, all over, including because of this wide-ranging wide -ranging implications of this case, that party might be behooved to fight the order at all costs and to never consent to jurisdiction. Um, this, of course, played out in future, in future cases. There are, however, two other issues that we think are of a special importance and merit further consideration, and that is in regard to the so-called separate entity doctrine and whether Kohler has replaced that doctrine, 
and the extent to which assets, that is to say assets which are not known, can be garnished by means of the Kohler opinion. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to David Scott. We'll continue from there. So perhaps uh, the most interesting question in the post Kohler world and the most important is the validity of the separate entity doctrine. The separate entity doctrine essentially states that each branch of a bank is treated as a separate entity for attachment purposes. So if a bank has a branch in Kansas and a branch in New York, uh, assets held in the Kansas branch cannot be attached by a suit of the New York branch. Uh, many read into Kohler an abolishment of this doctrine, but others uh, disagree. And, uh, Many courts, uh, particularly at the state level in New York, seem to share the concerns of the dissent in the Kohler case. And the dissent there was concerned that the Kohler decision would essentially open the floodgates to judgment creditors, that New York would become a mecca for judgment creditors to come, domesticate their judgments, and use the New York courts to enforce those judgments against foreign assets that are held in banks which happen to have a branch in New York which includes most major banks throughout the world. And so the answer to this question of the separate entity doctrine really depends on which court you look at, or which court you ask. One major case on this is the Samsung Logic case. This is a New York Supreme Court case from 2011. And keep in mind that the New York Supreme Court is the trial court. This is not the high court of New York. So the precedental value of this case is not very great. But being a, a relatively recent decision, uh, there has not been a lot of litigation yet involving Kohler to really address these issues. And Samsung is an example of a New York court who is taking heed of the warning issued uh, by the dissent in Kohler and is, seems to be making efforts to try to limit the scope of Kohler and to really limit how broadly Kohler will reach. In this case, Samsung is a judgment creditor. They're a South Korean shipping company who received a foreign arbitral award from a London tribunal against three judgment debtors. These debtors are two Chinese companies and a Hong Kong company. The award was confirmed in a related action in the Southern District of New York. The judgment creditor here, Samsung, sought to have the New York court issue a turnover order against the Bank of China for any assets of these debtors which the bank may be holding even though those assets would be held in the Chinese and Hong Kong branches of the bank because none of these parties really had much of a connection to New York or the Bank of China that is placed in New York. The court here looked at Kohler and said the Kohler court never even addresses, addresses a separate entity doctrine therefore it is highly unlikely that the court had any intention of abolishing this doctrine that they didn't even address. So the court rejected the judgment creditor's plea and refused to issue a turnover order against the Bank of China. In doing so, the New York Supreme Court uh, took care to reaffirm the old doctrine of the separate entity doctrine of when the separate entity doctrine can be uh, avoided. And it's only in very limited circumstances where judgment creditors will be able to get around the separate entity doctrine. Restraining notice must be served on the bank's main office. The bank's main office and the branches must be within the same jurisdiction, and the bank branches must be connected to the main office by high-speed computers or be under the centralized control of the main office. There's very limited circumstances in which this doctrine can be avoided, and this was not one of those circumstances. And so the Supreme Court reaffirmed the separate entity doctrine and has seemed to limit the scope of Kohler. But there are other New York state courts which disagree with this and agree more with my next case, which is the JW Oilfield Equipment versus Commerce Bank case. Now, this is really the only case on the federal level we have seen in the post Kohler world to directly address this issue of the continuing validity of the separate entity doctrine. And this case found the Kohler court to have essentially done away with the separate entity doctrine 
at least as far as it relates to post-judgment attachment. Uh, in this case, J.W. Oilfield, our judgment creditor, had successfully defended his suit and obtained an award of attorney's fees in Oklahoma. The judgment debtor in this case happened to have assets located in the German bank Commerce Bank. Commerce Bank, like most other large banks throughout the world, has a branch in New York. Our judgment creditors here, known of the caller case, took their judgment to New York and sought to have the Southern District of New York compel a turnover order to Commerce Bank to bring into New York the assets of the judgment debtor which were held in its branch in Germany. The court here read an implied abolishment of separate entity doctrine into the Kohler case and issued that order. Uh, in doing so, the court noted that New York courts can exercise general jurisdiction over a foreign corporation where the corporation is engaged in such a continuous and systematic course of doing business in New York as to warrant a finding of its presence in New York. Now clearly, having a bank branch in the state and doing business out of that branch meets this definition. And with the courts finding the abolishment of the separate entity doctrine, the assets held in the bank's Germany <coughs> branch were fair game to our judgment creditor. The next major issue in the post Kohler world, as Dave mentioned, is whether Kohler allows the turnover of any assets or where the assets have to be specifically identified by the judgment creditor. And pretty much every court who has addressed this issue seems to agree that the assets have to be identified. Samsung is a great example of this, uh, this instance again. Uh, if you'll remember from Kohler, we were dealing with the turnover of specific assets, stock certificates, which the Bank of Bermuda had in its possession. In Samsung, the judgment creditor asked for a turnover order of any assets which uh, the Bank of China may be holding of the three judgment debtors. In reality, the judgment creditor really didn't even know if the Bank of China had any assets of these debtors. They're essentially seeking the court to issue a fishing expedition to tell the Bank of China, go through your records, see if you have any assets of these debtors, and if so, bring them into New York from your branches in China and Hong Kong. Samsung Court said this is not what Kohler uh, holds, even if the separate entity doctrine is not valid anymore. That the judgment creditor really has to specifically identify the assets that they want to be turned over and go after those specific assets and not have the bank go on a fishing expedition uh, for these assets. There are some other limitations of Kohler which judgment creditors need to be aware of before jumping up with joy about the decision. Uh, things such as certified securities and security entitlements, which are governed by the UCC, remain governed by the UCC. Kohler really does not do much to affect these securities. As well, certain debtors, such as foreign states and foreign sovereign banks, which are governed by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, remain governed by that act. So as a judgment creditor, you really have to be careful to know uh, who your debtor is and what assets of your debtor you are going after and what acts govern those assets. Because if your debtor, your assets are governed by an act such as the UCC or the Fo Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, CORE may not be able to do a whole lot to help you. Some closing thoughts on Kohler. Uh, the dissent in Kohler seems to have been correct, that New York is becoming a bit of a mecca for judgment creditors. This is a, a relatively recent decision, so how it will play out has not fully been worked out yet, uh, but it does appear to be a great place for creditors to go to enforce judgments against foreign assets of their debtors who happen to hold those assets in banks which have a branch within New York. Uh, but before, you know, before creditors can get too excited, they have to keep in mind the limitations of the case that some state courts do seem to be trying to limit the reach of Kohler while other courts uh, give a very broad reach to the decision. Uh, with, as with any uh, sort of issue like this, in which there is a broad difference in interpretation among courts, we can expect this case and these issues 
to be analyzed again by higher courts within New York and likely in a relatively near future. So for the time being, Kohler is an amazing case for creditors. This is a creditor's best friend, but the scope of it really is not known at this point and is an evolving area of law which creditors will want to keep an eye on to see how it plays out in the coming years. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate who will discuss how to domesticate a judgment in New York. As Dave said, New York really appears to be the rising mecca for enforcing judgments against foreign assets. And there are two big reasons why this is so. The first is that banks are there. It makes it easy to get personal jurisdiction over the banks and thus gain access to any assets the banks may hold. And the second reason is that New York case law and New York statutes make it relatively easy to take a judgment from any state or any federal court in the country and turn it into a New York uh, judgment in order to follow the same track that Kohler did. So what we're going to do is, is walk through basically the process. Um, if you have a, a creditor approach you in your practice and say that he or she wants to follow the same track that Kohler did, take a judgment from another state and bring it to New York in order to gain access to any assets that are held by a bank there, how do you do that and, and what are the steps that must be taken in order to do so? And there are four main um, chunks of information that you need to pay attention to, um, four main steps. The first is how you convert a foreign judgment, a sister state judgment, to a New York judgment. The second is the process by which you enforce it or the rights available to the creditor once it's been domesticated. Third is executing the judgment, what assets can and can't be reached under New York case law and New York statutes. And fourth, as Dave mentioned briefly, the turnover proceeding in New York and how one actually accomplishes a turnover. Now under Article 4, Section 1 of the Constitution, a state must give full faith and credit to the valid final judgment of another state, provided that that judgment complies with the jurisdictional requirements of the Constitution and the law of the state in which it was granted. Now it's state law that prescribes procedures that creditors must follow in order to domesticate a judgment from another state into the state in which they are trying to get it. There is some uniformity to the process considering the fact that many states have adopted the Uniform Enforcement of Foreign Judgments Act, which prescribes a straightforward method of registering a foreign judgment by a simple clerical act. New York, however, has altered the process somewhat. Um, New York makes a distinction for domestication of foreign judgment purposes between a judgment that was obtained on the merits in another state and a judgment that was obtained either by default or by confession of judgment. And the, situ and the situations in which a judgment was obtained either by default or by confession, New York has a different procedure that it follows. Regardless of the procedure used, however, um, it's relatively easy to domesticate a judgment in a New York court, hence the reason we're seeing so many judgment creditors that are doing it. So we're going to walk through the two basic procedures that are used to convert a sister state judgment to New York judgment. And there's actually a flow chart that I'm going to have um, the guys hand out to you that puts it in a little easier form to understand um, and simplifies the process somewhat. So the first procedure is what is used when the sister state judgment was obtained on the merits. And this is Article 54 of the New York Code. Through the expedited procedure laid out in Article 54, any federal or state judgment in the country can be rendered a New York judgment by a simple clerical act. Um, it's a simple filing procedure what happens is that a judgment editor, excuse me, a judgment creditor must assemble four different items. Um, they're an exemplified copy of the judgment from the sister state, information about whether any of the debt has been paid off up to this point, information about whether there have been any stays on the judgment, and the defendant's last known address. At this point, the creditor would provide these four items to a New York attorney, in which case the New York attorney would pre prepare the necessary affidavit. Um, and then file it with the New York court, in which case the judgment has been domesticated. Now, in doing a little bit of research, it appears that the, um, the, the fee that is generally charged for the service isn't that great in comparison to the potential benefits. Um, on the whole, the majority of New York attorneys that provide this service generally charge between one and two, one and two thousand dollars to do so, with the average being around thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. Now in this, um, in the Article 54 process for domesticating a judgment, 
the possible defenses that can be raised are very limited. They're restricted by the full faith and credit clause. So any collateral attacks can only be on grounds of lack of jurisdiction of the originating court, competency of the originating court, or fraud on the judgment. Inquiries by the forum state or the state where the creditor is attempting to have the judgment domesticated into the merits of the sister state judgment are precluded in this type of situation. Now the second procedure is the one used when the sister state judgment was obtained by default or by confession of judgment. And this is where New York courts or New York law differs from most states that have adopted the Uniform Enforcement Foreign Judgments Act. And this falls under Section 3213 of the New York Code. And 3213 is essentially a motion for summary judgment in lieu of a complaint. What this means is that the plaintiff must serve the defendant with a summons, a notice, a notice of the motion for summary judgment, and any required supporting papers. The filing and service of the motion commence the action and the defendant or the judgment debtor is given a certain amount of time to respond. A 3213 hearing will then take place, in which case if the motion is granted, the judgment is for the plaintiff and the, the judgment creditor's judgment basically becomes a New York judgment in the same way it would under Article 54. If the motion is denied, the action is then converted into an ordinary proceeding. The moving and answering papers that were filed will be treated as the complaint and the answer, and the case can go forward. So what this means is basically, if it's a good judgment, even if it was obtained by default or by confession, the process isn't that much more difficult than it would be under Article 54. Either way, it's gonna be a simple, more or less filing procedure. The only added step under 3213 is that hearing. Regardless of which of these two procedures is used, once the judgment has been domesticated in New York court, the clerk shall treat the foreign judgment in the same manner as if it has basically been a New York judgment all along. This means that the state's judgment enforcement and satisfaction procedures are immediately available to the judgment creditor. So once it's become a New York judgment, how do you actually decide what assets can be executed upon? With the exception of certain specific categories of exempt assets, in the case of an individual judgment debtor, a judgment can be enforced against any real or personal property owned by the judgment debtor or against any debts due to the judgment debtor. New York statute and case law allows execution upon any intangible interest, which could be assigned or transferred, whether it constitutes a future or present interest, and whether it is vested or not, as well as any property of the judgment debtor held by a garnishee, regardless of where that property is actually located, as long as the garnishee has a branch or office in New York or is otherwise subject to New York jurisdiction. And that second category means that the asset itself can really be anywhere. It can be abroad or it can be anywhere in the United States. As long as the garnishee, as long as there's jurisdiction over the garnishee, that asset can be brought in. So how does the judgment creditor actually get to the assets? This is through the process laid out in Section 5225 of New York Code, commonly called a turnover proceeding. Now, a turnover proceeding is a post-judgment in personam remedy that gives the judgment creditor an order commanding the debtor or the garnishee to turn over assets in satisfaction of the judgment. It's important to note, as Dave said earlier, that the turnover proceeding is a proceeding against the person or the entity in possession of the property. It's not a proceeding against the property itself. And again, this is in contrast to a pre-judgment attachment motion where there must be in-rem jurisdiction over the actual asset. Post-judgment enforcement requires only personal jurisdiction over the entity in possession. Now, there are two types of turnover proceedings. 5225A is the turnover proceeding used when the judgment debtor actually is in possession of the property. And in that case, the judgment debtor, debtor may be ordered to turn over specific property even if the property is abroad. So if you have a judgment creditor that comes to you and says, you know, I know that this debtor has a bag of money sitting in his apartment in Italy, you would use 5225A to gain turnover of those assets in possession of the judgment debtor, bring them to New York, and they would be turned over to the judgment creditor. 5225B is the statute that is used against the garnishee in possession of the property belonging to the judgment debtor. As long as the bank or other entity in possession of the asset does business in New York, as almost all of the banks, major banks in the world do, the garnishee can be ordered to bring the asset to New York 
or it could be seized by the creditor, whether or not the creditor, the debtor, or the asset itself has any connection whatsoever to the state of New York. Now this turnover proceeding is a special proceeding in which, again, the third party garnishee is actually named as the defendant. Three things must be included in this turnover proceeding. The garnishee must be named, it must be shown that the garnishee actually possesses the property of the judgment debtor, and it must, there must exist a basis upon which personal jurisdiction can be asserted over the garnishee. So what if we have a situation where a judgment creditor approaches you and says that they have a judgment against this debtor and they know the debtor holds property in, in a few banks around the world, but they're not sure which, which bank actually has enough assets to satisfy the judgment or it, if any of them do have any of these assets. Under 5223 and 5224, of the New York Code, judgment creditors attorneys may file, may serve questionnaires called subpoena ducis tecums or information subpoenas upon potential garnishees without any prior showing that the garnishee actually possesses any of the judgment debtor's property. If through this questionnaire it's shown that the garnishee does possess such property, under section 5222 of the New York Code, the judgment creditor may serve a restraining notice upon the potential garnishee which restrains the recipient from disposing of any of the judgment debtor's assets that it may possess. Now this is, it, there needs to be a distinction here that these processes under 5222, 23, and 24 aren't the actual turnover proceeding. They're the way um, in which a judgment creditor can identify the assets because as was mentioned earlier, under the Kohler decision, um, a court can't simply require the turnover of any assets. It has to be specific assets. So 5222, 23, and 24 are the way in which to identify those specific assets and then keep the garnishee from disposing of them in order to allow the judgment creditor time to begin this turnover proceeding. And ultimately, when these proper procedures have been followed and a garnishee is ordered to turn over the assets, he or she must do so because full civil and criminal contempt sanctions are available for violation of a turnover order. So ultimately, what does this all tell us? Um, this was the statute relied on, the, relied on by the Kohler majority to justify its decision. And this tells us that New York courts can order a bank with a presence in the state to turn over to a judgment creditor any property it is holding for the judgment debtor, as long as that property is identified. Even if the bank that is holding that property to branch outside of New York or even outside the country, and even if neither the judgment debtor, nor the creditor, nor even the property in question has any ties to the state. So this basically is just an overview of procedurally how you would go about following the path that Kohler himself did. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who is going to explain to you how this would work out under New York, or excuse me, under North Carolina law. Thank you. Okay. Um, North Carolina adopts the Uniform Enforcement of Foreign Judgments Act and it's used to, to get a turnover um, in another jurisdiction. Um, it's been adopted by all states uh, except for um, Indiana, Massachusetts, and Vermont to implement the full faith and credit clause. And also the Virgin Islands has implemented the act. It enhances um, consistency and, and promotes reciprocity. Uh, but some states have not incorporated all the provisions. Um, like Kate told you about New York not enforcing the uh, default judgments. I've uh, put up this chart that's in the print version of the North Carolina um, General Statutes Annotated. And uh, I couldn't find it on, online, but um, it is in the print version. And um, it looks very helpful for, um, you know, as a reference for comparative law in, in the enforcement of judgments. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty much based on, on, on statutes. Um, with one exception, Maryland um, also um, includes judicial proceedings, so that's a good heads up if you have any um, situation that, that might involve <coughs> Maryland. And I, and I like the chart because it was able to you know, quickly get me that information. Um, okay. We've created a hypothetical to explore how a judgment in, in a case that had parallel facts to Kohler would be executed in North Carolina. Um, J.C., a resident of South Carolina, obtained a judgment in a South Carolina court against uh, Deborah, a citizen of Mexico. She keeps securities in the Bank of Mexico based in Mexico City. Um, it operates a subsidiary in Charlotte, 
and our question is, can JC get a North Carolina court to compel the Charlotte branch to turn over um, assets held in Mexico? Um, JC would first have to domesticate the judgment and pursue the enforcement of the judgment um, through attachment and garnishment. Execution is the, a the action of enforcement. Attachment is ancillary to execution, and garnishment is ancillary to um, attachment. And that's the way North Carolina conceptualizes it. And what kind of helps me to, to remember that is that I think of it as um, sort of like um, Russian nesting dolls, where one is inside the other. And it just helps me keep it straight. Um, North Carolina def defines a foreign judgment as a judgment rendered by another state entitled to full faith and credit. This law does not apply to the enforcement of foreign judgments of a different country. Um, courts may enforce those on the principle of legal reciprocity and in the case of arbitration, a 2009 treaty. Um, the treaty couldn't have helped Kohler. Um, it was Kohler span uh, 1993 to, to 2009. Um, so arbitration would not have been a, a good alternative in, in that situation. Um, but it, it may be something to consider if you have a client um, who is in a contractual relationship where they might want to go directly to the, the Mexican uh, courts. In the traditional areas of law, there, there really isn't a treaty that covers it, so Kohler is the, 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 the way to go, the path to go. Um, J.C. South Carolina judgment will get full faith and credit as long as it is not against the public policy of our state and does not fall under certain family court order exceptions to full faith and credit. Since neither exception applies to J.C., he can proceed and file the judgment. He must first file the judgment in the office of the clerk of the Superior Court of um, any county of the state in which the debtor resides or owns real property. He needs to submit the judgment with an affidavit that states it is final and the amount unsatisfied. It will then be docketed and treated as a domestic judgment um, would. The, the proper court within the jurisdiction to enforce the judgment is the one that would be proper for an, an action of the amount uh, remaining on the debt. Uh, court, court, court costs are also determined based on the amount owed on the debt. Okay. Um, before the, before the judgment can be enforced, um, JC must serve notice on Debbie. He must give her a copy of the judgment, the affidavit, and a statement that the judgment was filed in the clerk's office. Notice needs to include his name and address as well as his attorneys. He's required to inform Deborah of her right to request relief within 30 days, and that if no relief is sought, it would be enforced as a North Carolina judgment. No action may be taken to enforce the judgment during this time. Um, Debbie is entitled to all the defenses that she would be able to use against a North Carolina judgment. If she files a motion for relief or a motion for um, defense, the motion, the um, judgment, the enforcement of the judgment must stop um, without security until the court acts. Um, an appeal pending will also freeze the action to enforce. Additionally, a stay of enforcement uh, by the South Carolina court that rendered the judgment would also be honored. And um, some of North Carolina statutes, like uh, execution statutes, like 324.3, specify that the penalty for failing to comply with its provisions is the amount due on execution with costs. Um, though North Carolina law allows less remedies for the creditor than New York law, the penalties for violating it are significant. And um, just have a note of interpretation on, on attachment statutes. Um, attachment. You know, att attachment is a statutory remedy with, which, must be, with, which must be strictly um, construed. However, substantial uh, compliance with the st statutory requirements um, will suffice. So um, a debtor can't get out of things by like, a technical error. As long as the creditor is substantially complying with the, the statute, not trying to stretch it out, um, you know, a minor technical error will not defeat the creditor. Okay, um, only, uh, only property within North Carolina may be attached, and um, that's discussed in, in a case uh, called Ward versus Coleman Manufacturing Company that um, was decided in 1966 by the North Carolina Supreme Court. And what they do is that they, they um, cite this rule from a, a 1904 case um, 
And the, in the 1904 case, the judge was actually describing the position of R.J. Reynolds. Um, so that it's not actually, uh, so it becomes like part of the um, common law, I think, in 1966, because that's when you know, the, the North Carolina Supreme Court kind of took it as their rule. But in 1904, they were basically just describing R.J. Reynolds' position. And um, the rule is that the corporation who is the garnishee, in this case, must have such a residence and agency within the state as renders it amenable to the process of the court. The principal defendant, who is the plaintiff's debtor, must himself have the right to sue the garnishee, his debtor, in this state for the recovery of the debt. And um, it must appear that the situs of the debt is in this state. And so that's the, <coughs> where the um, 440 um, comes in, 440.4. The R.J. Reynolds action kind of turned on B. It was the garnishee, and it was trying to claim that um, it could not be sued in the state of North Carolina. And that argument was unsuccessful. Um, in order to, su to subject a, a debt to um, garnishment, um, I'm sorry. Okay, if those requirements are, are met, the, the sheriff may levy on a share of stock in a corporation by delivering copies of the garnishment process to the agent of such corporation. So if the stock has been sur surrendered to the corporation which issued it, um, so like if, if, if the securities that, that Deborah had in the Bank of Mexico, if they were stock in the Bank of Mexico, then this would give um, JC um, a remedy. Um, the Bank of Mexico could be um, restrained or enjoined um, from transferring the cer a certificate of the stock. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily say that, you know, he can take the securities, but if he um, can get the Charlotte branch to um, have this injunction issued against it, um, he could sue them if they violate it and get the entire costs uh, of the um, uh, judgment plus the, you know, the cost of the court. And um, one thing to, to keep in mind uh, here is that an injunction is a form of equitable relief. Um, North Carolina adheres to the clean hands doctrine. doctrine. If um, JC was unethical in the pursuit of the debt, a North Carolina court could refuse to enforce the judgment on the grounds it would be a violation against the public policies governing equitable remedies. So that might be an exception to, to full faith and credit. And um, if you want more information about the clean hands uh, doctrine, you can check out the focus outline that Dave and I did. Um, we reviewed a, a case called Stelling versus Wachovia Bank, and it's a, a, good, a good case dealing with that doctrine. Um, Okay, in, in summary, JC would not be able to attach Deborah's securities held in, in the Mexican bank because the property is not located in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, if, um, you know, if he could, um, like if, if he was in a business relationship with, with, with Deborah and he can kind of foresee or anticipate what, what's, what may happen and where the, the securities might be located, um, you know, arbitration might be a, a way to go now, but it seems basically between the, like the Kohler trend or, or arbitration. Um, but the, like I, as I said before, the, the, um, there's no treaty supporting that, the, the traditional judgments. So um, that's a little uncertain. Okay, and thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. And does anyone have any questions for anyone in the panel? Or? <coughs>